Um, hello, everyone. First of all, uh, please accept our apologies for this the delayed start. Um, um, I'm thankful to South Asia, Swaz South Asia Institute uh, for hosting this event, um, particularly Matthew Nensel, the head of the Department of Politics and National Studies. Um, he won't be able to join us. He has got some last moment departmental meetings, so he sends his apology. Uh, so this session would be about 20 to 30 minutes. So son yes. of Abbas will speak about the book, and then we will have around 40 minutes for the Q&A. Uh, just a bit of introduction for Hassan Abbas. Hassan Abbas is a distinguished professor of international relations at the, at the Near East South Asia Strategic Studies Center, which at the best university in Washington, D.C. He's the author of numerous books, including the Taliban Revival, uh, uh, Pakistan's threat into extremism, and his recent book, Prophets Hair. Um, there's also a discount available for this book, which I'll share in the chat. And without further ado, I would hand over to Hassan Abbas. Uh, you're muted. Can you hear me now? Excellent. Thank you very much. I am uh, really honored and delighted, and my sincere apologies for a little delay. Uh, that was because of a little technical issue, but I'm glad um, I'm with you, and um, I'm deeply grateful to the hosts for the, for the interest in the book as well. I will... Uh, be brief in my introductory remarks because I think that would be great if we have a conversation and I'll be more than happy to respond to the questions. Uh, but to frame the issue, I, I can talk about three issues borrowing those developments from uh, what's happening in Afghanistan and Pakistan today and then link those to some of the major themes and then we'll open up for a conversation um, of course, we know and those of us who are following developments in Afghanistan that um, a new prime minister has been uh, appointed by Mr. Hebatullah, the supreme commander or the supreme leader of Afghanistan, the new uh, prime minister. They're still calling it acting prime minister. And also they're saying this is <clears throat> for the time being um, till the outgoing prime minister um, is recovers from his health challenge. But this is about Mullah Kabir, who is the new prime minister. And uh, this is very important for the reason that there is this tension and debate uh, and conflict in some ways between the different uh, major factions of Afghanistan uh, under the Taliban, ranging from um, what we call for the purpose of simplicity or easy um, to, to digest those who are in Kandahar, those who are more hardliner, more conservative, more from the old guard and among those who are in Kabul, uh, although uh, there are Kandharis in Kabul as well who are holding some very important positions, uh, but um, I'm mentioning it just to explain the differences in terms of political outlook, in terms of approach, in terms of worldview about engagement with the West and, and with the region. Those in Kabul who are holding cabinet positions are um, apparently more open to conversations, dialogue, um, not all of them, but many of them. And those in Kandahar are looking for uh, Islamic system from their interpretation and their worldview. Uh, and they are more inward looking and want to follow more the traditional Taliban worldview, which in my view is quite very conservative, orthodox and dogmatic. The challenge was who to pick as the prime minister to lead the cabinet. And uh, the choices were between Mullah Barada, uh, who had led the negotiations with the United States, who is a very important leader. He's one of the founding uh, members. He was also um, serving almost as the deputy to Mullah Umar in the initial uh, arrangement. He was so close and so you know, held such an important and leading position. And, and then he was kind of ousted from his role of influence. And although he's the deputy prime minister and he now leads all the economic ministries and he defines the economic uh, policies of Afghanistan today, uh, but he is no more in the driving seat in terms of influencing policy. But he's also seen as somebody, uh, and the reason why I'm kind of um, going into the profile of these leaders up front, just to using it as an example to explain 
um, the internal workings of Taliban today. That Mullah Baradar uh, is a hardcore Taliban. He is from the original founders, but he's the one who had gone through apparently kind of a rethinking and um, having spent time, some time in jail, in, in this case, the Pakistani guest house, because Pakistanis, um, uh, Pakistani military and intelligence were annoyed for him, with, with him because he had reached out to Karzai at one point directly. The point I'm making is Mullah Brother would be in the camp of those pragmatic elements who wanted engagement with the West. And on the other side, the contender, which I've explained and discussed actually in the book also, is as Chief Justice of Taliban, currently Abdul Hakim Ishaqzai, um, whose um, claim to fame is, is also his recent book, uh, which I had a chance to read um, significant parts of the book in, in in translations, uh, which are uh, some of those are reflective of very backward thinking and extremist um, uh, worldview. Rather than picking one of these two, I think there was a lot of pressure on Mr. Hibadullah to pick up some Isaac Zay, but he uh, and he wanted to ignore uh, Mullah Brother. And I personally believe Mullah, it was Mullah Brother's right to be uh, to have been appointed even previously. But on this again, he opted for somebody which on the middle way I'm calling. Um, in a traditional sense, which is uh, Mullah Kabir, who uh, remained governor previously as well. He remained acting prime minister in the first government, uh, the first Taliban government also. And he, but importantly, he has been part of the Do part of the Doha negotiations. So he has more international exposure. He is um, a conservative element, but he is also aligned with those who were in Kabul, who were engaging with the others, and he has the trust of Mullah Ibatullah as well. So long story short, but upfront, my first point, um, this is uh, can be seen within the problematic world of Taliban, can be seen as, in fact, a reasonably, uh, as a reasonable step because they opted for the middle path. That, that was one current story that I wanted to link with the themes uh, of the book. The second major theme of the book is um, looking deeply into the religious worldview of the Taliban. Um, we, we often think of them as a militant uh, organization from some point of view, a terrorist organization, uh, the militant for sure. They had led the insurgency, um, fought the insurgency, um, used all kinds of tactics. And at the end of the day, they are going through a transition. They had, for the last 23 years, operated as a militant organization, as a militant organization which was more focused on hit and run, which was more fo focused on how to disrupt things. Um, and now all of a sudden they find themselves in the role of governors. Uh, and, and the governance is something which requires a very different skill set, a very different mindset, a very different approach. So this massive transition from, from a militant organization which is involved in insurgency to an organization which has to govern, which has to be answerable to people, whether they are representative of the government or not is a different debate, but they, they are uh, at the helm of affairs. They control the finances as limited as these are. They control the bureaucracy and sooner or later they will be held more accountable or more answerable to the people. So that transition is also a very important phenomenon and I wanted to link this with their religious worldview which is within the Sunni Islam, uh, which is the, from within the Sunni Islam, there's a Hanafi school of jurisprudence. And within that, there's more of a political come, uh, more of a political uh, side of Hanafi Islam in South Asia specifically, which is linked to the school or madras of Deoband in India. But in now the, the idea of Deoband Islam or Deobandi Islam, as you may frame it, is also uh, changed over time. It was an anti-colonial anti movement. Um, the, the Indian uh, Deobandi school has now transformed, um, transformed or changed to quite an extent. Um, then within Pakistan, this is the, the Karachi madrasas are uh, linked to Deoband, which are quite hardliner, which is which are very politically motivated also. And then of course the Jamaat -e Ulama Islam, which are part of this um, group which have a political wing or they have a political orientation. They're always involved in, in politics of the country. And last but not the least is the Khaybar Pakhtunkhwa or the Madrasa Haqqaniya in that region, which had become more of a, a very aggressive or assertive, um, I should say, uh, worldview of uh, Deoband. And the Afghan Taliban then are an extension of that, what we had, 
of that Deoband worldview, which was part of the Afghan jihad against the Soviet Unions, which is also far more aggressive, um, and if I call militant as well. This orientation and this change is extremely important to understand because that would help us understand how traditionally and historically um, the role of Islam has played out in Afghanistan whether it is in insurgency, whether it is in resistance, whether it is in defiance to power, or whether this is used as a connecting link with other Islamist movements globally. This, the idea of the Uband is extremely important. And I'll be doing injustice to, the, uh, to Afghanistan if, here, if I'll not mention that historically also, uh, Afghanistan was a hub of, uh, of the mystical dimensions of Islam and Sufi Islam as well. Uh, you pick any major Sufi silsila, and you will find some of its roots or some of its major uh, primary adherents who had lived in Afghanistan, from Rumi to so many others uh, scholars of within the Sufi tradition had lived and they had thrived in Afghanistan. Even today, those some of those groups have stayed. They are perhaps under the radar, but they are still surviving. And Deoband Islam, as soon as they'll get more settled, the Taliban, they will have to engage with these um, the forces of, um, for the lack of any other word, I would call the, the, uh, the, the non-political uh, wing of Islam, if I may call that. I know that's not the perfect or even a, maybe an acceptable uh, fr frame to some, but just to make, uh, uh, make the point clear. And this is very important because the biggest challenge today in Afghanistan to Taliban and many others come from Daesh and Islamic State in Khorasan. And they have adopted the most extreme and deviant uh, version of Islam. And that has forced Taliban. The reason why this whole brief conversation about Deoband is important, that unlike the first Taliban government, when they had gone against the Sufi groups strongly, when they had gone against the, the Shia minorities and Hazara community, today, um, the new Taliban, in a just for the purpose of explanation, they are offering security uh, to many um, of these uh, Sufi and mystical places. And, and these mosques, the famous place of Sakhi shrine in Kabul, and, and also uh, Taliban had initially provided uh, support and security to some of the Ashura processions also, which are mostly um, uh, commemorated by the Shia Muslims, but also um, Sunni Muslims participate in, in those, not necessarily all practices, but for them it is um, in many ways equally important. Taliban, are the new Taliban, if I call that, are cognizant of this fact. They are not new in a sense, they have come from somewhere out or they are all the very young people uh, who, who were born and raised after um, the, the, the fall of the old Taliban government. But what I'm saying is that they have a slightly different orientation. So the first point was the divisions within the Taliban, which at times are tribal, at times they are ethnic, in times they are about engagement with the West. That's why the, those are those divisions, which, which are, that's why we use the Helmand group, Helmand group or the Kandahar group or Kabul. They are not very well defined uh, uh, in, in these terms, but by and large, just for the purpose of explanation. The second one is the issue of, uh, of religion and where this will go. Um, who wants to emphasize what based on which religious teachings, or is it all politics? And last but not the least is this, um, the third Taliban uh, group, or uh, you can say Taliban are being blamed for their association with them, and rightly so, which is the organized criminal groups, which are the drug smugglers, which are the criminals, which are other extremist organizations which operate in that area. They, these are mostly allies of Taliban. Look at the Pakistani Taliban. Uh, or, or look at ETIM, or look at the remnants of Al-Qaeda, and also the drug smugglers and the criminals who operate and thrive in that area. Tal the Afghan Taliban today that we see have greatly benefited from their alliance with all these uh, 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 criminal um, and other militant groups also, which have other local agendas. The these three things have to be kept in mind if we want to understand where Taliban stand today. Having said that, uh, two more aspects, and then, then we can open it for the conversation as well, which are very important to understand. Even if Taliban have not changed, and I, I can mention this, I have asked many people who deal with Taliban regularly uh, in Pakistan, in, um, in the Western countries, those who are engaging with them, 
And whosoever I asked about the religious orientation of Taliban, I was told Taliban have not changed ideologically. They are the same old people in terms of their ideological outlook. However, I was told that, and rightly so, that this Taliban have far more exposure of engagement, of other engaging with the other worldviews than the old guard Taliban. Uh, they are the ones who have operated from Doha. They are the ones who had made many trips to UAE. They are the ones who are engaging with Turkey. Uh, Pakistan, of course, and Iran were always two important players, uh, historically also, and from the Afghan jihad years as well. These engagements have had an impact on the Taliban outlook. That's why those relatively pragmatic elements in Kabul who want to engage, who want to talk to others. Linked to this idea is that when Taliban came back to Afghanistan or in Kabul to be exact, they were always in Afghanistan, uh, so getting support from Pakistan elsewhere, but always a reality. And many of our friends, the Afghan diaspora want to negate it. And with all my tremendous respect for them, because they are going through real pain at this time, Taliban were a local phenomena as well. They were facilitated in some ways from Pakistan, got their sanctuaries, but to always this view viewpoint that Taliban were outsiders, were imposed on us. The, all the major studies, those people who have studied Afghanistan, they, they would deny this fact. Uh, yes, you can argue about the extent of their outside influence and in internal, but these were, uh, most of these people were local. Yes, they were trained and educated outside at times, but you can call them a regional phenomena as well, but their roots and their establishment and their sanctuary within parts of Afghanistan, even during the time of the Republic, Republic cannot be denied also. The point I'm making, when Taliban went back into Kabul, they never burnt down Kabul. They, uh, they inherited the institutions that were built by the West and by the, some of the Afghan themselves. Um, they, they were not used to running these ministries in a sense that there's a minister, there's a deputy minister, there's a certain bureaucracy, all, the, uh, all these academies, the police academy, um, uh, military academy, uh, the whole idea, as basic as it may sound to you, but think for a moment, the whole idea of this modern uniforms of police and military, these were not things that Taliban had ever associated themselves with in a very institutional sense. So they are trying to inherit these institutions, the banking system, the the uh, uh, tax collection system tax they were always good at uh, people stopping people at tech, at uh, posts check posts and they they were actually had mastered the art of building check posts uh, in an area and disruption but the the new institutions of collecting funds and taxes and distribution and budget uh, which we have seen is is relatively new for them that's why in that sense they are new also referring to a point i made earlier uh, a majority of Taliban, I would argue, the young Taliban, are the products of an era of insurgency. They were born after Mullah Omar was ousted from, uh, from Afghanistan in year 2001. These are in the age group of 1920. This, they were born even afterwards. They are the ones who are products of also these telephones. This is not the generation which was able to uh, gain access to people through their cassette revolution, uh, so to say. These are the ones who have been very well connected to the world of technology through the Twitter account. Look at the followers of uh, um, Zabiullah Mujahid, the spokesperson, for example, 750,000 followers, um, so many others. So uh, I doubt these are all Westerners who are following. It means it's people, majority of them in diaspora also, but local uh, Afghans. So they have mastered also the art of technology, linking the communication system. These, and it's not that they will only are listening to their own messages. It, it is the, the technological revolution in a sense for Taliban has opened up the world to them as well. So at least they're engaging with many of those ideas. That's why I, I bring, come towards the kind of my final point based on these ideas that they have not burned down Kabul and they're engaging with these institutions. And some of them are, have also in defiance of their own system by remaining within the system. Um, there are areas in, in the book I've mentioned uh, which had uh, defied the, uh, they were in defiance of the Taliban uh, 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 imposition or uh, their new rules and policies about uh, women education. 
Um, there are others who are pushing back. Um, again, uh, Haqqani is the last person you would uh, mention as a model or, or as a flag bearer of, of democracy or of, uh, in any say, progressivism. But at the end of the day, he's among those who's making a case um, against Mullah uh, Hibatullah's um, very dogmatic and controlling style of politics. And th those are uh, in the public know how these are uh, interviews and statements have been publicly quoted. So there's an internal debate taking place as well. But the last point that I was, and with which I would go towards the closure is that based on these divergences, be, based on these uh, diversity of also views, you can argue the dominant factor is the rigid, orthodox, problematic Taliban. But the others are also not being uh, removed or sidelined or killed or ousted. They are also existing. They are also pushing back. Those in the Doha also have a different uh, view. I think much positive uh, in comparison to what we are seeing in Kandahar. Based on that, I my argument in the book is for the for the policy world is to engage with Taliban, because my argument is that engaging with Taliban is going to help the relatively moderate forces. And uh, because the other option is uh, you just close the door on them, isolate them further. Well, we tried that. Someone telling me that not to engage with Taliban is the right policy because they are bad people is a very simplistic solution. So where were we in for the last 23 years? Trillion dollars spent. We tried everything. So those Afghans who still uh, are allied with the old Republic idea, the idea, getting associated with idea is very good. However, the corruption, the incompetence of the uh, Ashraf Ghani government is also in front of us. The, the, the Western alliance or the Western nations also got really disappointed when they realized um, that uh, the corruption rackets were right there, the, the, whether the warlords or the other kind of networks which are taking money, stealing money away from, the, from, from uh, projects which would help the people. Uh, that realization also led to this whole idea of withdrawal. And the Western uh, policy challenge, uh, challenges are also extremely important. I have talked about those. The idea that somebody could, could go inside and build a nation, no one can build a nation from outside. The state building project was also flawed in more ways than one. So there are challenges in the Western approach to that as well. And last but not the least, I still believe something that can really work out well is a regional consensus. Currently, uh, Pakistan has its own interests, the way they are operating. Iran is deeply involved. Qatar, anyone, con anyone who continues to think about only Pakistan and Iran, uh, I think is not either reading or not uh, um, updated on what's happening in Afghanistan today. Um, Qatar is as important a player. Uh, Turkey, UAE, they are, some of them are vying with each other to get contract from Kabul. So Uzbekistan is providing them uh, free electricity. Another country is offering them uh, the internet connection. China is now deeply involved. They want, want engagement. So the regional, if there is a regional consensus, currently all the regional players are following their own interests, which are at times divisive. Each one of them is trying to neg negotiate with Taliban about their own interests. If there is a regional consensus, and that's what I mean by engagement, if there is a regional consensus and those countries walk up to, uh, to Kabul, and make a case on any number of issues, uh, policy-related issues or, or issues of extremism. Currently, I think there's an emerging consensus about religious extremism and militancy and terrorist, um, is, uh, terrorism issues. However, if there is a broad-based approach, which is uh, in the, in the um, spirit of, of a diplomatic outreach, um, Taliban cannot deny them. Taliban have learned, if they have learned anything, they have learned that they don't want to be isolated. They don't want to go back to mountains once again. And that's where I would end. That's why my case for engagement, I, I'm uh, really convinced that um, the engagement is going uh, to bring better news. This may, yes, this may not lead to the democratic ideal we had, uh, but those who wanted democracy uh, had their chance uh, and they, they missed it. Hopefully again, um, that moment will come when because of the public pressure, uh, Taliban will have to go become more accountable. But at this moment, if we are denying that Taliban exists as a reality, we are living 
in a fool's paradise. Um, that's why engagement is important. Um, that's what how I would frame the issue. I'm absolutely, I'm an academic. I'm open to criticism. Um, I would love to learn, um, correct any things um, and, uh, and share many other related things also during hopefully Q&A uh, that I've learned since the publication of the book. Uh, because this is often a continuous process and one continues to learn and correct uh, and readjust and reevaluate. Back to you, Jafar. Thank you so much. Uh, it was a brief but very important and engaging intervention. Uh, so now we open this, this discussion for Q&A. We have roughly around 40 minutes. There is this uh, Q&A section where you can type your questions. So meanwhile, we receive questions. Let me let me post. Uh, you mentioned about Generation Z in your book, and on the other hand, there is this internal struggle for power between, you know, so so called moderate versus hardliners. So how do you how do you see this Generation Z fit in within the what you call Taliban 3.0, and how this phenomenon of Gen Generation Z influence the future scores of Taliban? Thank you very much. And because you mentioned Generation Z and Taliban 3.0, I'll very briefly mention that I framed the whole issue of Taliban 1.0, 2.0, and 3.0, dividing uh, for the purpose of understanding into three phases, because Taliban 1 is the Taliban movement um, the, the, uh, after the Afghan Jihad, sponsored by the Pakistani madrasas and intelligence, getting their own support base, and, and ultimately Bulla Omar uh, building his new um, Afghan uh, state or Afghan uh, government the way they liked it. That, that ended in late 2001. I think that was Taliban. Um, I lost the connection, but good. I am now able to connect through my computer, so it might be better even. Um, so I was uh, at a point where I was explaining the um, Taliban 1.0, 2.0, and 3.0. And I think where I lost the connection was this conversation about the young Taliban the Generation Z, um, and they, th this is a group of Taliban which is actually inspired by a different set of ideals and their reasons and their driving force is, is a diff altogether a different phenomena. What I mean by that is these are mostly the young Afghans who had no access to education, no employment opportunities, frustration, lack of exposure, and that they were the ones for whom it was a badge of honor to be a part of a resistance movement, to be part of a force which is defined, which is part of a force which, according to in some cases, uh, the local traditions challenging the, outs uh, the outsider or those who are seen as allies or, uh, or, or extension of any international force, that that is they were borrowing it from the local traditional history. And they are the ones who, who, who all they knew was to, to challenge and to disrupt, and they were getting paid for that. They now have different set of expectations, because I believe that Taliban, if let's say there are 100 Taliban, it's uh, the, those who are really ideologically inspired are not more than 20 to 30 percent. The rest are these allies who are part of Taliban uh, because they, at that time, there were no other options. There were mistakes committed. Uh, uh, by the Afghan security forces, by the international forces, in many cases, which allowed the, the Taliban to able to recruit more people. And look at just the way in which Taliban had gone back to Kabul. It was a sudden surprise. Even some of the major intelligence agencies in the world was taken by surprise because they were not expecting the Taliban. They knew the Taliban are at the gate of Kabul, but how they reached that gate of Kabul is a very insightful story. Taliban under actually uh, Khalil Haqqani, the uncle of Siraj Haqqani, who is known as a master negotiator, he was able to go to so many different tribes and negotiate with them and tell them, look, Americans are going, we have a deal with them. Uh, they are going out because we have signed a peace deal with them. So we are coming back. And uh, if you don't want us to, if you want that we should not take revenge or that we should not come after you, this is the time to have some kind of a peace arrangement with us. That's how, and that is why there was no war when Taliban really came, walked back into Kabul. And, and this also surprises me. And that puzzles many of us. Why Afghan security and police forces never challenged them? So these were the young Taliban uh, who were also uh, a force to be reckoned with, 
but led by some of their strategists who cut these peace deals and, and brought the Taliban back into Kabul. So these, these are the um, force who everyone is thinking they're they are depending on. One group um, um, argued with me during my research because I had this uh, 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 opinion that these young people have different ideals they have different goals, they have different aspirations. In their phones, they see the world uh, and they want to be connected to that world worldview. Some others argue with me that no, these young uh, folks uh, actually lack exposure, they are more radical. And it is the older generation, which because after they were ousted, they went through a rethinking process. They are rethinking whether it was worth while to say that we will not hand over bin Laden and in the process lose Afghanistan. And some of them went through jail, some of them were in Doha, that the older generation, which is no more in the battlefield, nor can they fight, have gone through more of a transformation. I think the reality or truth may be in the middle of it, the pressure from this young generation who want job opportunities, who want the good things in life, which they are watching on their phones. They, want, they don't want to be isolated. That, that, and they, they will have an impact, I am sure. That's my, my theory. Yeah. Okay, we have a couple of questions. So if you can address them briefly. The first question is from Abdul Malik Said Amin. Um, his question is how Taliban will solve the issue of legitimacy, transfer of power and replacement of Amir and how without certain written constitution and Shura things will find legitimacy and predictability. Excellent point. I mean, legitimacy is a big challenge. The only thing they could have done was that they could have called for a lawyer jirga. But I think Taliban were scared from the lawyer jirga because they're not sure that all the tribes that went for a transitional peace deal with them will necessarily sign on to a very conservative agenda that Taliban have. So legitimacy was a big issue. So they had a shortcut of sorts. They um, called for a jirga but only of the religious scholars. Some people say two to 3,000. Some people say more people joined. Mullah Hibbutullah uh, was brought in Kabul and he gave a speech. It's a, it, The text of the speech is already out. I have, I have that in the book as well uh, that is available. Its translation is available where he starts off by saying um, the whole Ummah is proud of uh, Taliban uh, because they are back in Kabul. Well, that's not true. The whole Ummah is not very proud uh, of Taliban. Yes, Taliban um, have a certain support base in the region, and some people have uh, uh, alive, alive with them because of their worldview, but it's not a regional phenomenon even, what to talk about a global phenomenon. Yes, they can inspire them. The, the longer Taliban stay, it will be uh, a hopeful sign for many other such movements. But th th during this transition, this legitimacy issue is a big issue. They got that support weight based from the clerical regime or the clerical uh, network that they have, and they are now pitching it. And they, they realize the, the legitimacy issue because they, they are still calling all their top position holders as acting. What do you mean by acting? which is that they, uh, they have to come up with a formula, uh, whether that's a, in the shape of a constitution or something like that. I think that is still an open question, but also in parallel, the reality is Taliban are completely in control of the situation in terms of uh, military control at this moment. So legitimacy, they should be thinking about it. Ultimately, if they want recognition, they'll have to have some form uh, or, or some process to which they can establish. So. The idea of constitution for them, um, I'll, I'll not say this is a totally, totally alien idea because I'll just, if you Jafar, allow me very quickly mention uh, one story that I heard, uh, which is that we know that uh, President Ashraf Ghani um, escaped, um, but they, I, I'm told that there was in parallel another effort as well, which was that Ashraf Ghani should have left Afghanistan along with Mr. Abdullah and there was this trans, uh, transition or this interim government, which was supposed to be led by a top Taliban leader, Hibatullah, most likely, but also that that interim cabinet would have support base from present, former President Karzai, also from some of the other members uh, of the Afghan cabinet and Taliban. And those people together had agreed that they would accept 1964 Afghanistan constitution as the interim constitution. 
So they was, uh, and Mullah Brother was also supposed to play uh, an important role. If that tells me, if that story is accurate and the, the sources are, which, which I'm convinced that that was a real attempt, it failed, but it was a real attempt, that there are among the Taliban people who were agreeable to the 1964 constitution. So, so that's why the legitimacy issue will stay there, but there's some hope that some elements within the Taliban realize that and, and, and acknowledge that. That, that. That's my response to that issue. Okay, so there is another question. There is a critical comment and a question from Bismillah Alizadeh. He writes, with all due respect, uh, this is disappointingly simplistic and reductionist portrayal of the Taliban. Many of the extremely determining factors like the ethnic factor, the proxy factor, the ideological legacies of the Cold War era, Jihad, and the role of foreign players like the US are either dismissed or downplayed. These factors played a critical role in, in empowering the Taliban and sustaining them right now. Furthermore, the internal complexities within Afghanistan society is also dismissed. So his question is, why these factors are not sufficiently taken into account within the academia generally, and this book in particular? This criticism is welcome. Um, all criticism is welcome, because that's how we engage. Of course, um, if you are just borrowing from what I've said um, in one hour, I cannot explain the research that is behind um, it and all that is in the book. Um, I have explained some of these issues. Some of these issues have not gone into depth because that's a previous book. Uh, not that I'm here to sell all my books, but my previous book called The Taliban Revival that was published in 2014, that goes deep into the historical context, that goes deep into the state building project, that goes deep into, uh, for instance, uh, some of the movements of Tehrike Taliban Pakistan, the Afghan Mujahideen, what was that background? And every book cannot repeat the whole history. There are some outstanding books by Ahmed Rashid, by many other Western scholars, by local Afghan leaders as well. I, for this book, I had to go uh, to look at some of the local publications of, of the Afghan scholars, um, which because during the last 20 years, one really good thing that had happened was the American University of um, Afghanistan, many other research centers, which produce outstanding work. So every book cannot, pinpoint everything that has gone wrong. The, the focus on this book was to start exactly this debate um, that we are having to look very, very contemporary because for the historical perspective, those are some of the accepted norms. So I am by in no way denying that those factors, whether those ethnic factors or those drivers or that failure of the Afghan Jihad project, I think that was the most, the biggest modern problem that we had came out from the Afghan Jihad, because you go to every, any country where there is a religious extremist movement, and you'll see whether it is Islamic movement of Uzbekistan, whether that is in Malaysia, whether that is in Pakistan, uh, even in India, all these extremist movements that you'll see, these were led by those Mujahideen who had come to Afghanistan to fight the former Soviet Union. That's where they're training Al-Qaeda even Daesh in some ways, as an extension of Al-Qaeda's worldview. So there's no denying the fact of all those issues. But in a normally contemporary book where you want to look at the problems today, you have to start from a point uh, when you argue. That's why very clearly we said the return of the Taliban after the Americans left, because there's excellent scholarship available on the points you have raised. I'm not denying that. Uh, and thank you for raising that point. So we have another question from Alia. Um, how has Afghan Taliban's entry into state power influenced their relationship with Pakistan, with the Pakistani Taliban and the Pakistani state, particularly the Pakistan military? Do you hold a similar view regarding the need for Pakistan state's engagement with the Pakistan Taliban as you do regarding the need for the world's engagement with the Afghan Taliban? Thank you, Pakistan. If there's any country which has remained engaged with Taliban throughout, that is Pakistan. Um, and, uh, and those relations were very close, um, whether um, those were during the initial years of the rise of Taliban. Uh, there are different theories. Uh, some believe that that was totally a product of the Pakistani intelligence mind, which I think is absolutely wrong. Taliban were a movement that had come, that was born out of the whole Afghan jihad experience. They were local factors. Yes, most people uh, among the original class of, of Taliban were a product of Madrasa Haqqan, 
Pakistani or Pakistani madrasas. I'm reminded always of this book by General Kamal Matinuddin. Actually, the first book on Taliban was written by a three-star Pakistani general who, who did a great job by explaining that at the time of the Afghan Jihad, inverted commas, uh, inverted commas, because I don't think all right, that that qualified as a real jihad, jihad under any circumstances. It was a political campaign. The General Ziaul Haq was given money by the Saudis and the US was involved and the Western world was involved. But the idea was to build a chain of 30,000 madrasas uh, at that time. Um, sorry if I might not be remembering that figure right. So I, 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 I want you, anyone who wants can check that. The book is widely available. That this chain of madrasas on the Pakistan-Afghanistan border, the purpose was all Mujahideen who are coming back, keep them there or their children keep them there because we will have to continue to fight the Soviets for a long time. So let the Afghans fight that war. So Pakistan is severely criticized for that as well. However, the movement was indigenous also. Pakistan facilitated it, supported it. And then during the, um, when uh, Mullah Omar took over, initially, I mean, there was um, various incidents that Taliban started challenging uh, Pakistan as well at that time. This is famous case of uh, the Pakistan soccer team, which went and they were sent back with their heads shaved off because they had committed the biggest sin of uh, playing soccer while their shorts were on rather than pants. And they were sent back with their heads shaved off. So pa Pakistanis were surprised. What has this happened? The, the radicalization had impacted Pakistan as well. The Rike Taliban Pakistan was always seen as a separate entity by many people. And there's some many scholars, myself included, which were saying it from day one. These are two sides of the same coin. The Pakistani Taliban have greatly benefited from Afghan Taliban because they have survived in the same century. Some of the Pakistani tribes uh, in that region, Mesuds, Waziris, not all of them at all. Some of them were providing, they, they lived in the Waziristan area. They provided sanctuary to the Afghan Taliban. They had closed linkages. And at the end of the day, that's what we have seen. The Pakistani Taliban became powerful because of Afghanistan. Now that Taliban are back in the government and Pakistan had an important role to play in all of this, not the most decisive role though. I, I differ with, the, uh, with those scholars who argue that Taliban could not have uh, succeeded without Pakistan. I think Pakistan played a role, but not the most decisive role. There were other players as well. Iran had played a role also. Uh, Doha, without the space in Doha for negotiations and those 25 families of Taliban who had moved to Doha, there would have been no space to get a negotiated deal which allowed Taliban to go back without the US deal with Afghanistan which led to the release of 5,000 hardcore criminals from, uh, from Kabul. That was uh, uh, President Trump who was convincing Ashraf Ghani, please release these people. So there, there were many players for different interests, different reasons had, had created this, that space for the Afghan Taliban to go back. Pakistan is one of those players. Pakistan has remained engaged, but the, the problem on the Pakistan side was the, the, the attempt to try to maneuver and micromanage and control the Taliban. And Taliban are not ready for that. In fact, in, based on my research, one of the first things that Taliban did after coming into power was telling Pakistan, please uh, stay away. Uh, please don't, we don't want to be seen as your extension. And um, I, in the book, uh, I mentioned how uh, Pakistan still had, still, still had influence on some Taliban leaders. How many? There's no way to quantify. But if I have to give one example, I would say when the Pakistani intelligence chief, General Faiz Amid, went to Taliban, that picture, I'm sure all of those who follow this story, they know it. When the Afghan Taliban uh, were being pushed by Pakistan to add some of the folks in the cabinet the Taliban were formulating, it was not that the Pakistani ISA chief had a blank check and he was dictating, um, he was trying to get his nominees in. How many nominees he got in? Maybe five, maybe seven. Um, I have heard maybe the 10 or 12 of the 33 were really close to Pakistan. So Pakistan is, had influence on at least one third of the Taliban in a significant fashion. Now we had seen Taliban refused Pakistan to help Pakistan in defeating uh, Tariq-e-Taliban Pakistan. 
they gave a couple of statements here or there, trying to discourage them, but never went after them, never handed over any TTP militant to Pakistan. So Pakistan is kind of getting uh, back, uh, uh, paying back through its nose some of the blunders that Pakistani strategy uh, is responsible for. Pakistan has a huge role to play in terms of they're, they're trying to help Afghanistan engage with the rest of the world. But Pakistan will have to join hands with Qatar, with UAE, with Turkey, with Iran, with China, which they are doing already, and develop a regional consensus, as I had mentioned. So Pakistan remains an important player, but Pakistan is also responsible for many of the problems that Afghanistan is facing. So this, this is time to compensate for that by listening to not only the Taliban, but the, the, the ideas, the uh, request the demands and the aspirations of the ordinary Taliban of the ordinary Afghan, who are um, I often feel, and this I, I'll then go back to you, Jafar. I think in all of this, we often focus so much on Taliban and regional players that the plight of the ordinary Afghans uh, is is missed out. Uh, ordinary Afghans have gone through hell, and they currently are going through hell. Time after time, it is the, the minorities in Afghanistan, it is um, the other people who, are, who have nothing to do with all the war, but they are the biggest victims of Taliban. And, uh, and they are the ones uh, who are being repeatedly forgotten by the international community. No one, it seems to me, and this is, I've quoted one of the very senior US officials in my book, in the conclusion, who when I asked about Taliban and about Afghanistan, uh, the, the, the senior former official said to me, I don't want to repeat those words. Those are very tough words. Uh, but it was something to the effects, who gives a damn about Afghanistan? And so that's at times the, the, the policy perspective um, uh, globally as well, which is very, very tragic. Um, just a reminder, if I also put this promo code uh, given by the Yale University Press, so you can use this promo code and get a book in a discounted price. I'm conscious of time, so I'm combining two questions here, which is about, uh, which is from Sitara and Mishal, and they're asking, are Taliban 3.0 likely to repeat their violence and massacres against vulnerable groups like the Hazaras? Excellent question, and I must uh, salute uh, the Hazara community and Sitara and many others who have never met, have never directly engaged, but I've seen your work. And um, within the Afghanistan, the community that I'm talking about, which has gone through very, very tough time, um, uh, Hazaras are on top of the list. Everyone uh, took out their anger on us, the Hazara. And it's also tragedy that people don't talk about it often. Um, I have seen many books in Afghanistan um, which, which talk about the Afghan history from um, the, the, the Durrani empires to Abdul Rahman and others they were also butchers of Hazara community. I mean, Hazara community, if there's any community which has really gone through kind of genocide, and this is not only Hazara in, uh, in, in Afghanistan, the Hazara in Pakistan as well. Ask the Hazara community in Quetta what they have gone through and why people don't even count, don't even bother to count their dead. Um, they, they go out for the universities or schools, their buses are destroyed. They go to shrines in Iran via uh, Taliban, they are taken out, shot dead, uh, asking people's names. So the Hazara community is one example uh, of the nature of atrocities that so many people have gone through. Now, having said that, I think this Taliban government have a slightly different view, or I should, I should put it and qualify it, that some of the leaders of Taliban today have a different opinion, I believe. That's how, what is my basis of saying that. And I've received some uh, criticism from my Hazara friends also, which is, I'm, as I said, as an academic, that's um, so long as it is in the spirit of engagement and discussion and conversation, so long as it is not abusive, that, that's absolutely legitimate. Hazara, the, the Taliban have realized that what they had done in terms of massacres of Hazara previously is something that agenda is now being taken over by Daesh and ISK and even Al-Qaeda. Al-Qaeda had tried to go through a middle path and Al-Qaeda leaders had tried to stop uh, Zarqawi and others by saying, don't go the sectarian battle. And I think that some Taliban have gone through a learning process as well. They would, some of the hardcore extreme Deobandis historically were always saying Hazara Shias and they, they, 
both issues. Hazara look different because of their ethnic background, so they are targeted. They are Shia Muslims, so they are being targeted by extremist Salafi, and, uh, Wahhabi, and other groups as well. Extreme Deobandis always had a problem as well with, with the Shia, but they would always say, okay, they are um, either uh, deviant or not Muslims, but this the killing spree is, is more of a state problem which, which many of the leaders Rule, including rulers of Afghanistan had. But in the modern sense, because Daesh had taken that agenda, Afghan state today, Taliban, are trying also uh, to be, uh, uh, to, to consider that and provide some security. So I've interviewed people who told me among the Hazaras um, in Kabul, that as soon as they came back into power in August 15, right after that Muharram and Ashura were there, and they provided security. There were black fa flags all across Afghanistan. They had, st uh, not uh, all across Afghanistan, all uh, across Kabul streets, I should say. And they provided some security to them as well. They had their conditions. They said, don't do the Zanjiz, the, the, uh, the, the flagellation which, which, uh, with, with blood letting and all that. And they had said, that's unacceptable to us, but you have your processions, you have your majalis, go for everything. And then also, in, uh, I talked to somebody in Mazar Sharif, a person who had gone, a very important Shia leader who went to Mazar Sharif. And I interviewed him and he shared his whole charity work and transcripts of the meetings and recordings also. So this was not a mere conversation. This, this I had seen evidence that, Mazar, that uh, uh, Ta Taliban said to Shias in Mazar Sharif that we have issues with your one big procession we want you to divide this big procession into four small processions. Of course, she has thought they were trying to show that she has not as powerful in Mazar Sharif for weak. Uh, but the Taliban said, no, the problem is of security. We cannot provide security to a big one procession. We are better off to provide security to four different uh, small processions in places where we want you to be. And that's, uh, we'll provide you security. I said this, these two examples, which I'm very convinced are truthful. In, in a major international network. I think it was uh, probably Al Jazeera. And I received calls from friends in Hazara and they offered me an alternate view, which I've also, to be fair on this issue and objective, I've mentioned the alternate view as well. My Taliban friends told me, uh, my uh, 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 Hazara friends, I have some friends among Taliban also, I must mention, uh, those who shared many in, inside stories as well. The friends among the Hazara community told me this, what you're saying is only happening in urban centers because Taliban are fearful of the international image. They want recognition. They are being nice to Shias in urban centers, but in rural areas, they are taking our lands. They are pushing us out. Shias, Shias are being, Shia Muslims are being thrown out of jobs, which when I uh, try to verify, proved to be accurate also. So there are two parallel realities that are taking place. What future looks like I think knowing the history, knowing the Islamic history, and knowing the regional history, uh, the minorities will be in trouble. And that is a tragic reality. I, I, it's very painful to accept, but I wish I could have said that Hazaras and Shias and Tajiks and Uzbeks uh, and uh, Sufis, Sufis are equally under threat. Their, their zawiyas, their religious spaces, their shrines have been uh, destroyed and attacked. I wish I could have said, that there's hope. Uh, we'll that's why engagement is important. If Taliban are engaged, if there are some incentives, if they are dependent on some kind of international support and help and recognition, they'll have to provide security to these minorities and those even ordinary Afghans who are going through hell. Last point, I have talked to many people, the ordinary Afghans because of economic crisis are moving away from their towns thinking that they'll be close to Kabul so they, they will get some food. And the displacement in Afghanistan is as staggering. It's a huge numbers. And they are, are being pushed out by and by uh, snubbed by the Taliban. And they are not necessarily from one ethnic group or one religious group or the other. The ordinary uh, people, my most likely all Sunnis um, or local tribesmen, who are, who are also facing huge trouble. So that's why we cannot let go of this issue. We cannot ignore what's happening in Afghanistan because it's only a matter of time that it will start impacting the region much more severely. That's why I'm making a case for engagement. 
Thank you. We have roughly around nine minutes and we have still a couple of more questions. So I'm just going to pick uh, one of them. Uh, so Zainab Tuba asked, uh, you have said that it is better to engage with the Taliban so that they become moderate. Do you truly believe that such a thing would be possible while other countries would be in a way accepting all their extremism? No, I think by accepting and engaging with somebody doesn't mean that you are accepting all their wrongs that they are doing. Uh, because let's, for the sake of argument, let's say that not engage with them. What does that mean? That means you isolate them further, which means impact on minorities will be even worse. Impact, humanitarian impact will be even worse. The demographic changes that we are facing will, will worsen, which will also mean somebody's, it's a matter of time people will say, okay, now we are isolated. We are not engaging. They're all bad people. Let's bomb them again. We have bombed them. We have bombed Afghanistan. That's why Taliban are back into power because they survived. So the other option that we think of, we have tried that. We have tested that. And some of those who are responsible to build a new Afghanistan were more interested in making money, in making houses in Turkey, in UAE, in Qatar, in stashing money away. They ran away from Afghanistan, uh, taking away a lot of cash, at times offering some international leader from a country X to come in and take in their plane a lot of cash. Um, so the, the, the Afghans, those who were well-meaning, relatively educated, not bigoted, had their chance. They failed Afghanistan also. That's why I'm arguing, I'm not saying the, the uh, conversations or engagement will necessarily uh, modernize them. In, they, they, we have to increase their stakes in engagement with the outside world as well. Um, they, they, they will need it. Some of the, I was asked in another setting a question that whether the Diobandi Muslims in Pakistan can help, yes, they, they can. But you have to go for credible voices, not Fazlur uh, Rahman not necessarily Mr. Taki Usmani, who may be very important in a, in a religious sense, but there are other authentic forces who, who can talk to them in their theological terms and have an impact to them. Because we have to give everyone a chance to transform or change. We cannot let go of that. That's my, 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 my theory, or my humble uh, suggestion. Um, we have another question from Behenam, um, who is a hydropolitics researcher. The question is, you know, by, by diverting water of Helmand River, which have led to a humanitarian disaster in, in, in Iranian Sistan, what is your idea? Is it a leverage of political pressure or there is ideological causes? That's also linked to the idea of Iran um, and Afghanistan, both. I think water issues are related to the local farmers at one level. This is linked to some of the tribal associations as well. Um, however, if, if uh, Iran's success, I would call in Afghanistan, happened also in terms of their engagement and linkages because um, Iran was looking beyond uh, the religious connections. Many people wrongly assume that because Iran is dom majority Shia, necessarily their tools were the Hazara Shias. That's what the Daesh has been saying. And that's how some of the extremist groups have been saying about Pakistan. Every Shia has been asked, okay, are you close to Iran? They have nothing to do with Iran. Um, Iran, not trying to disrespect, disrespect everything on Iran, I'm saying the, the religious related networks have their limitations. It's more about geopolitics. It's more about resources. It is, um, it is more about control. It is more about um, the stakes and attempts to influence. It is more about their own infrastructures. It is more about refugee crisis as well. Uh, Iran and Pakistan have welcomed so many refugees, but um, and they received tons of money from international aid agencies as well in the process, historically. So th th this is more about money and more about grabbing resources than it is about religion. That, that, that's my understanding. Okay, so the last question from Abdul Malik is, he says, uh, doesn't the suppression of women's education contribute to a vicious cycle of illiteracy and extremism? Won't this unchecked extremism spiral out of control and attracting terrorists from various parts of the world? Unfortunately, yes. The answer is yes. If you will not allow girls to go to school, it is going to make you more bigoted. 
And, and that's why that's an extremely important issue. However, we from outside who are engaging with Taliban have to be very careful what's the Taliban's worldview and how best to, when to negotiate with them, which are the topics that should come first. Because they, they have also limitations and they have also boxed themselves in any effort or any question or any suggestion about women education immediately reminds them of the British colonialism to the British Russia war, to what the, the Pakistani madrasa influence, um, some of the, the other factors, they immediately become very, very defensive. And that's like ordinary human beings. We often know in a family member or a friend that, that even on a legitimate point, they are irritated for something. What do you do? How do you deal with them? You don't start the conversation from the point that irritates the other. Even if you are totally legitimate, you are totally right, but you don't start it if you want a good conversation. And you will say, let me build some trust. Let me talk to them. Once you build a little bit of trust, then the first thing that will come up when I'll really have a chance to cut a deal, when Taliban will really ask you, we need this intelligence support uh, to fight Daesh, which they're asking, by the way. They're asking for other support as well. It has to be give and take. Then you will bring this up. If you'll keep on bringing um, uh, up the issues, which rightly you have mentioned, um, Taliban immediately react to that. So I would argue your point is spot on. Without women education, I will go more than that. Without gender equality, without many of them, it's not only in Afghanistan, in Pakistan also, in other regional countries as well. Some countries which we think of very nice because they have beautiful plazas and beautiful hotels and outstanding airlines, uh, many uh, bigoted elements, they also don't consider women as human beings. And this is not my sentence. I can show you some of the discourses in their religious books. You'll be amazed how bigotry um, has a certain influence in uh, a network and discourse and narrative of its own that, that, that in inspires them. So while it is accurate, absolutely, we have to strategize how to take up this issue with Taliban and make it such an issue uh, that they cannot go and ask for this women rights and girls education at a time and in a way that they cannot say no. That will be a success. Thank you so much. Um, despite all the glitches and internet issues, we are finishing on time. Um, I'm thankful to Hassan Abbas uh, for his time. And I just received a message from Matthew Nelson. He regrets that he won't be able to participate. I mean, he didn't he wasn't able to participate today. Um, he sends his apology. Uh, again, um, there is a promo code if you want to buy a book, uh, you can use this promo. And I'm also thankful to the attendees uh, for attending this session. And yes, um, thank you and have a great rest of the evening. Thank you so much, Jaffa. Thank you so much, Swaz. Really appreciate all those who participated. Thank you. Bye-bye.